Okay, leaving DevTest. This is the uh, next um, live stream lecture. It's a continuation of last week's lecture. Um, <coughs> we ran out of time last week, so I was uh, forced to split the presentation across uh, two lectures. Uh, just uh, in summary of what we looked at. Uh, we looked at therapeutic ERCP, stenting, stone removal. Uh, there were a couple of videos. We had quite a few interactive questions, which uh, people were um, quite good at uh, responding to. And um, we had stopped just for before the open cholecystectomy. So this portion here um, is what we're going to go through today. There is an... Um, heading on open bile duct exploration, which is not going to be come, covered today. I'm going to actually cover that in an upcoming hepatobiliary surgery lecture. So we are going to look at rather laparoscopic uh, bile duct exploration and laparoscopic cholidocoscopy. And um, I've got a little bit of information and videos on each of those. Um, I'm hoping <coughs> that at the, towards the end of today's lecture we should have some time to actually look at some of the OSCE questions. Uh, only one of the recently posted OSCE questions has been attempted by more than five people. So I will only um, I will give everyone an opportunity to answer. I'll only uh, give the answer online during one of these live streams when an adequate number of registrars have actually attempted the question. Um, the no one is going to um, share your answers or <coughs> pick on you if you gave an incorrect answer. It's all completely confidential. I'm the only person that looks at the answers. Uh, but it's very important that you actually make an attempt um, to show your commitment and interest. If you're just uh, going to want to listen to hear the answers, then it's uh, not actually going to benefit you. It's important to actually make an attempt. And uh, even if you get it wrong, you're actually going to learn from it. Okay, so the first um, area that we're going to look at today is the open percutaneous cholecystostomy. This is a procedure that's done in a patient who is acutely ill. Um, they usually have some type of um, infection of a stone in the Hartman's pouch, and uh, they are usually too sick, unfit, unstable for a cholecystectomy and so they require an open percutaneous cholecystostomy. This may frequently be done in an ICU setting, uh, not in theatre. <coughs> it's usually ultrasound guided. Um, it can be done uh, with very minimal anesthesia um, or if the patient is already sedated and ventilated in ICU. Uh, it's quite relatively easily done. Um, typically in ICU, patients on TPN, for example, may actually develop an acalculus cholecystitis and <coughs> this will um, benefit the patients. Um, there are two possible approaches. One is transhepatic and the other is transperitoneal, as shown on this um, image here. And the question to you, which approach do you think is safer? Please post your answers to the uh, to the individual interview, not to the group, so as to give everyone an opportunity. Okay, uh, this is the video. Today I'll demonstrate a case of uh, um, percutaneous cholecystostomy. So this patient is having um, uh, um, cholecystitis with a significantly severely distended gallbladder and there's a tiny calculus uh, around the neck of the gallbladder. So now we are planning for, uh, because he uh, looks a little septic, uh, so we are planning for the settlement of the infection by draining the bile uh, using the percutaneous cholecystostomy. Once he settled down, then we can uh, plan for the elective cholecystectomy. So uh, on the on the C we have done the CT and we show severely dilated gallbladder and on the ultrasound nurses gallbladder is significantly distended, wall is thickened. So there you can see that 
the gall bladder uh, the distended gall bladder and uh, that is the liver surface so now we are planning to uh, through the transhepatic uh, cholecystostomy because this will help to uh, reduce the bile spillage into the uh, peritoneum as well as once the gall bladder get uh, uh, undistended or all the bile comes out the gall gall bladder will get retracted to the liver so it's a uh, uh, so we are planning for the transhepatic approach so i'm giving local anesthesia they um, this is the point we have marked and under ultrasound guidance uh, and that is the needle point so we are giving local anesthesia nice local anesthesia because it it is slightly uh, painful if we do without anesthesia so now we are accessing uh, with the 18 gauge shiva needle and there you can see and our needle is uh, touching the wall of the gall bladder and then we have entered into the gall bladder see i'm moving it up so that is the uh, gall uh, needle tip into the gall bladder so there you can see the echogenic tip moving right into the center so once we are into the gall bladder and there i am aspirating the bile sample uh, it looks more of um, um, black colored almost brown to black so i am passing the oven wire through the um, um, needle puncture needle so dilated the tract so we have placed the um, uh, eight french pictel catheter once the tract is dilated and that is the tip of the uh, the pictel curve into the gall distended gall bladder so there you can see the echogenic one so this is how the palpitation cholecystostomy is done two three days so once the tube is inside we have taken the suture to uh, secure the tube and this is the final picture uh, to keep the adhesive is of uh, percutaneous drainage of the gall bladder and that is uh, percutaneous cholecystostomy uh, in a patient uh, who is a, a septic and uh, uh, there is acute cholecystitis with severely distended gall bladder so this is dr shailesh vascular intervention video okay that's just quite nice simple video today i'll demonstrate a case quite well um if there's any questions please post them to whatsapp and um, i'll attempt to answer them during the video our next uh, topic is uh, percutaneous transhepatic cholecystostomy uh, colan sorry cholangiography this entails inserting a needle into a dilated dilated bile duct percutaneously and then using a sounding technique getting a catheter in and then injecting contrast uh, to give you an image um like this okay this is typically in patients who are unfit for ERCP or due to some anatomical or surgical variation uh, they are not able to have ERCP obviously this is a more invasive approach going percutaneously as opposed to endoscopically and so video clip coming up now by the previous stenting and this case was a case of cgb neck with local infiltration in the csd leading to uh, dilated biliary reticulus as we can see so uh, while we are doing for the while we are selecting the patient for the PTBD procedure, uh, proper scanning of the patient is necessary, and uh, we assess both the hepatic ducts, right and left, and preferably we do the PTBD in left hepatic duct. So it's better to uh, do the scanning from the mid abdomen and the mid line, right from the sternum area, and. Uh, look for the dilated biliary vessels. So here we will be showing you how to do the PTBD in a very easy process, very easy method. So after preparing the patient in the local area and giving the local anesthesia. <laughs> इंस्ट्रूमेंट थोड़ा बंद कर दो। करें तो बस। तो डॉक्टर पापी इस नाउ। तो डॉक्टर जी वही है। 
deep up to the liver capsule. We will be going deep up to the liver capsule to relieve the pain as much as it is possible because the liver capsule is a pain sensitive structure. So here we are seeing that uh, we have reached inside the liver and we are Dr. Papi is now infiltrating the endocrine tissue. Now, after infiltrating the LA in the required place, we will be waiting for at least 22 minutes to have a proper anesthesia in the area. And now we will be collecting the needle. Now, uh, I will load the picture catheter. No, Dr. Bapi will be loading the PPL catheter. We will prefer the PPL catheter because it has a self retention capacity. And uh, in comparison to straight catheter, it will have uh, there will be less chance of its displacement. So how he is uh, loading the pickle catheter? Pickle catheter is loaded. No, it's loaded. This is the guide way. And and this is the after uh, puncture. And straight in guide wire. And this is, these two are and the dilators. And these two are the dilators. This is the connecting tube for. And uh, now I'll give a small nick in the skin area mm. with the help of 11. Uh, with the 11 gauze needle that we can see so that we can easily get inside the skin and raise the required space. Okay. Good. Now, after giving the small incision. This is the 16 gas needle. Huh, definitely. Uh, it will be done by my junior, Dr. Bapi, and I will be describing the procedure. I will be guiding, uh, guiding the procedure and we will be doing that. Go to this. Uh, As well. So uh, now uh, we have located and we have found that this biliary radical is dilated and this this is the main you know, left main, left hepatic duct which is glossy dilated so we will preferably puncture this site hmm. and you can see that the patient is having uh, it's very much comfortable and there is no no okay. no but now where we can see the needle is going there now it's going well, very slowly we can see that it's going there. We are very close to a left hepatic, and now we are almost. We have reached to the wall of the left hepatic duct. No, I am. And now, yes. <coughs> One second. A small push, and after pushing that. We have actually reached. Uh, so we have reached to the bile shunt duct, dilated biliary radical. There we can see the movement of the needle tip here. And to confirm this, we will uh, aspirate uh, and we will see the free flow of the bile in the. Yeah, uh, yeah we are here. Here you can see that uh, there is a clear needle tip inside the lumen of left hepatic duct. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we will aspirate a little um, bile to send it for the microscopy and culture to... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a free... You can see that they have free bile is coming. Uh, uh, was, no, no, give, uh, give me 10 ml syringe so that it can be sent. Huh? Now, it's small 10 ml syringe. You will aspirate a small one to... But it's also. You will... Uh, it for the culture and sensitivity. Now, uh, now I'll, uh, I'll introduce so the guide wire. So, this is a straight in guide wire. Here you can see. 
This is a flexible end. This is a hard end. So we'll be introducing this flexible end. Now it's going. And we will try to push the guide wire as far as it is possible so that we can reach up to the confluence of hepatic ducts. And fridge. Because of bottom. So here we can see there is, this is a guide wire we have reached. Uh, we have reached, uh, we have reached the... Now, I am taking out the needle and introducing the guide wire. Okay. So, no, so now I will show you the guide wire in the dilated duct. So here we can see this is a duct and this is a guide wire within here. Here it is. So here, here you can see this is the guide wire within the duct. So now, I'll put the dilator. So first, uh, to dilate the track. Yes, ten. Eh? Yeah. Okay. This is ten phase dilator. This will help to dilate the track. And allow us to put the pigtail very easily. And one thing while you are dilating the track, you need to hold the guide wire so as not to displace. Otherwise, there will be the displacement of the guide wire and track bend may not be proper. So, here we can see a uh, no, little more. It's okay. Yes. Now we are taking out the guy that dilator, and I'm fixing and uh, holding the guide wire not to take it out. Now I'm taking the pigtail catheter and we'll be pushing this. We'll be placing the catheter with the metallic trocar and the catheter assembly. So now it's going and this is the final step, very easy, we have to just push it down, push it down very slowly and we can locate it with the ultrasound mazes here. So we have almost in the same track and now I will be opening this trocar and I will be pulling back trocar as well as the guide wire all together and at the same time Dr. Bapi will be pushing the pigtail catheter inside. Okay. So now here we can see that the flow of bile is coming out perfectly, freely, freely. Free without any blood mixed. So now he will be connecting the catheter with uh, Euro bag now. So, this is a procedure very clearly done by Dr. Bapi and myself, Dr. Saurabh. And you can see that the bile is very clear, there is no, no blood at all. So, we are okay. <coughs> I think we can stop there. Um, a bit of an amateur video, but um, it does show all the important uh, components of a basic uh, PGC <coughs> and uh, placement of a drainage catheter. And in the next the video, we're actually going to see the placement of a percutaneous metal biliary stent. Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, we've been doing the percutaneous biliary stent placement on this patient who's uh, actually got a tumor in her duodenum. And uh, usually it's done for patients such as this. Uh, often it's for uh, pancreas cancer or uh, cholangeal carcinoma, where there's some obstruction. Usually it's done by um, the GI lab endoscopy, but uh, sometimes it can't be done because the uh, obstruction is distal or there's altered anatomy. In this case, she has both, actually. She had uh, some surgery before on her duodenum, making it difficult for the endoscopist to get in, and also the uh, tumor is right around the distal duct. 
so I swear to it. A few days ago, she's already got access to the biliary system, and the tube is going through her liver into the uh, biliary system, and the tip that you can see on our pleural is, is coiled in the duodenum. So that part's done already. Basically, what you're going to do today just is uh, put in the uh, metallic wall stent. So let me get started. On our system here, Katie. Plural, we got Rena. Hello. And nurse Cassandra. Hello. All right. So we'll start with the uh, low plant treatment. Okay. Can you feel something here, low plant treatment? Let's just think of it. You can see the dilated ducts in the liver, the common wild ducts dilated. And pretty tight stenosis distally. Alright, and her anatomy is a little weird because of the prior surgery. Okay, so we take this out. Pulling back the catheter over the wire. Catheter straight out. Wire staying in. Alright, so there's no catheter is out. Right wire is in where it used to be. I'm going to put in a comfy catheter. Okay, so we've got to be... I'm going to put a hemp wire, it's just a little stiffer. A little uh, easier to dilate over. And Boston Scientific Wall Flex Stamp. That's a stamp. And it's the same stamp that was used in the GI lab by endoscopy. So it's reversible. And the stem we're using, by the way, it's uh, partially covered. So once it's covered, just the ends. Proximal distal ends are uncovered. So that middle marker that's pointed, that's pointed no return. So you can resheat the uh, stamp if you need to reposition it. But once you get past that, it can't be done. So just make sure you position. But you can actually see the waste of the stamp at that site where the tape is. Yep. Alright. Good, all right. So I stamp is in perfect position. You see the tape on the screen, there's the ways that should expand over the next uh, few days, actually. So uh, what we're going to do now is take up the deployment system. We have to buy wire to screw it in a Dawson meter. Good, almost done here. Let's get another uh, blank room. So here you can see that the contrast is in the biliary system that's going through this the uh, stand nicely. So that's opened up nicely actually. It's, remember when I started there was basically no contrast able to get through that distal uh, stenosis. Now it's going through nicely. And again that stand should expand a little more over the next few days. This is camp. If something goes wrong again we can just reaccess that. Okay. Um, that was the insertion of a stent, metallic stent, percutaneously. Um, if you listen to the operator, he explained why they were not able to replace the same stent by ERCP. The patient had had some previous surgery and it was not possible to access the biliary tree by ERCP. So they therefore had initially inserted a drain and um, uh, subsequently they, on this occasion, uh, passed a guide wire through the drain again, removed the drain and then passed a uh, self-expanding metal stent, covered stent, partially covered stent, uh, through the, over the guide wire 
and uh, they positioned it appropriately, deployed it, and they even showed um, a post procedure image uh, showing excellent um, flow of um, contrast into the duodenum. And six days later, the cholangiogram done through the dorsal molar catheter, which was placed um, again over the guide wire, um, showed that the stent had actually, the self expanding metal stent had slowly expanded over the next few days and uh, opened up the stricture very nicely. Okay, um, the next uh, video is on the uh, laparoscopic bile duct interventions. And um, take a look at that video. Here is a simple way for doing a laparoscopic common bile duct exploration. This is a young woman with impacted cholelithiasis after a partial cholecystectomy. At the first ERCP, there is a large stone in the bile duct. This is after cholecystectomy, and it looks like there may be a Maritzi component. After repeated ERCPs, there were fragments of stones in a dilated calm bile duct with a normal pancreatic obiliary junction. This indicates no cholelithiasis cyst. Therefore, the patient was brought to the OR for a CBD exploration. The tract from the patient's surgical drain was followed down to the gallbladder fossa. There were dense adhesions of the colon, omentum, and duodenum to the undersurface of the liver and the cystic plate. The area of the remnant gallbladder or common bile duct was exposed. A structure resembling the cystic duct was mobilized away from the port hepatis with bile coming out of it. This was consistent with the small cystic duct, and in fact, there really was not any significant amount of gallbladder left behind. I proceeded to expose the porta hepatis completely and had good visualization of what looked like the anterior surface of the bile duct. To facilitate better exposure, a Nathanson liver retractor was inserted. And now we have good visualization of the bile duct. An anterior cholelithiasis measuring approximately one centimeter was made using the energy device. The bile duct was completely impacted with stones and debris. To help keep the surgical field clean, I inserted a specimen retrieval bag and began disimpacting the bile duct carefully and meticulously. As the bile duct became more disimpacted, it seemed as though stones and debris kept coming to no end. With some space in the bile duct now, I irrigated out to see if I could flush out any stones or additional debris. A 12 French red rubber catheter was introduced into the operative field, and this was used to help irrigate the duct a little bit more precisely, particularly into the distal duct. This helped flush out additional debris and some larger stones as well. The red rubber catheter can function as a quasi-trocar for insertion of a Fogarty catheter to balloon dredge the duct proximally and distally. This is a highly effective way of pulling up stone debris from the distal bile duct in particular. Some more stones are released and the biliary stent is in view. During the operation, several stones were retrieved and 
careful attention was paid to retrieving the stones and placing them all in the specimen retrieval bag. It appears as though in the proximal duct there are some stones lodged into the second order ducts. As these can be visualized, I'm able to pull them out. But if necessary, the balloon can be used to help pull those down as well. The proximal ducts seem clean and clear at this point. Additional passes with the balloon are made. And additional stone material is retrieved. Once the duct seems clear, I prepare for a T-tube cholangiogram under fluoroscopy using a C-arm. The T-tube is prepared and sutured in place. There are two distinct filling defects that are facetted and consistent with gallstones. So the T-tube is removed and an additional pass is made with the Fogarty And as you will see, both of the stones are retrieved. The T-tube is inserted again. and we prepare for another cholangiogram. And on this occasion, a classic normal cholangiogram is achieved with no filling defects, filling of second order biliary ducts, and filling of the duodenum. The stent was left in place. The T-tube was removed, and the cholidocotomy is closed. In this case, I did not leave a T-tube as the biliary anatomy was native and ERCP can always be performed again in the future should it be necessary. take a look at is a laparoscopic cholidocoscopy. So we've seen that uh, we have a scoping scope device, so you can actually even do a cholidocoscopy via a uh, duodenoscope during ERCP. But um, the other option is to actually pass a cholidocoscope at the laparoscopic approach. Watch a video on that. This video depicts a 56-year-old patient who presented with abnormal liver function tests and a mildly dilated common bile duct on ultrasound. Cholangiography using the Kumar preview clamp and catheter demonstrates a distal common bile duct stone. It is elected to proceed with a transcystic duct laparoscopic common bile duct exploration. A cystic ductotomy is performed with the endoshears in the mid portion of the cystic duct. The multiple instrument guide is used to guide a 0.035 glide wire inserted through a 10 centimeter by 12 French ureteral balloon dilation catheter. The catheter is carefully positioned in the cystic duct and inflated to 10 atmospheres pressure and held for 
90 seconds. The balloon is deflated and the dilating catheter and glide wire are removed. The multiple instrument guide is then used to manipulate the 2.8 millimeter flexible cholidocoscope into the cystic ductotomy without the need for use of grasping forceps, which are damaging to the scope. In the course of this introduction, excessive pressure is applied and the cystic duct becomes evulsed. Fortunately, there is enough of a remnant left that this can be grasped and a lower cystic ductotomy made. This problem likely could have been avoided if I had used a 15 French ureteral balloon dilator rather than a 12 French. Alternatively, the glide wire could have been left in the common duct and the cholidocoscope introduced over the glide wire. Here the lower cystic ductotomy is made with the endoshears. And again the uh, multiple instrument guide is used to guide the cholidocoscope through the cystic ductotomy and then into the common bile duct. Once the cholidocoscope has been advanced into the common bile duct, the picture in a picture feature is activated and the video is seen in the lower left corner through the cholidocoscope. The screens are then switched with the laparoscopic view being the small left lower screen. The stone in the distal duct is seen in the cholidocoscope view. A 120 centimeter by 1.9 French tipless nitinol stone basket is then advanced down the working channel of the cholidocoscope. The basket is extended and the stone is snared in the stone basket. The wires around the stone are seen. The stone is held tightly in the basket and in this particular case the stone ruptures and the resulting debris can be seen flowing with the irrigation out through the ampulla into the duodenum. That is not a normal occurrence. The ampulla is now quite clear and we are left with a residual stone fragment which can be seen spinning in the irrigation fluid. The nitinol stone basket is reintroduced and this single large fragment is then engaged in the stone basket. It is important that the stone be caught in a nice even symmetric fashion for removal through the cystic duct. In the lower left of the screen the cholidocoscope and basket are withdrawn through the cystic duct and the stone is seen outside the cystic duct within the stone basket. The cholidocoscope is reintroduced into the cystic duct for a final inspection 
and a final cholangiogram is shot through the cholidocoscope. Note the nice taper to the distal bile duct. The cystic duct is then ligated using an endo loop. This short cystic duct remnant required precise placement of the endo loop. To ensure that uh, the loop did not become dislodged, a hemoclip was placed as additional insurance. Having successfully completed the stone extraction procedure, it is now time to proceed with a standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure to finish the operation. This operation took just under 100 minutes and uh, patient recovered in a similar fashion to any standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure. Okay, that's a um, uh, very nice uh, video showing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and stone extraction. So we've now seen a number of different approaches to the bile duct uh, percutaneous approach, ERCP approach, now laparoscopic approach, and we will also look at the open bile duct exploration in the hepatobiliary lecture series. The uh, last video clip that I want to show you is just a quick uh, T2 cholangiogram. Hi friends. The CBD exploration was done in this patient for removing the stones. And uh, here now you can see a T-tube cholangiogram. Here we can see the remaining stones. If, le is, if it is left after the surgery, but here there is nothing like this. So we need to perform the T-tube cholangiography. What happened, the initial stage, the initial image will demonstrate the contrast in the T-tube, which will go there as well as it will be seen in the common wild duct as well as the pancreatic duct. And the later, we can see the contrast is spreading throughout both the right and left hepatic duct superiorly. And we can also see the stump of the cystic duct which we have ligated or cut while removing the gallbladder. And there is no evidence of any leakage from that path and blow we can see the common bile duct when it enters into the geotrum so this is how the t tube cholangiogram video looks like you have seen a lot of films but this is the actual the path of the tie you can see in the video form thank you for giving your valuable time it's just a little video clip showing you um, the t tube cholangiogram. These are the kind of questions that come out in OSCEs and to get still images and it's um, important to actually understand how this image is obtained. Um, unfortunately, we don't always get an opportunity to see these procedures being done. Therefore, uh, these videos will be of benefit to you. That brings us to the uh, end of this uh, lecture and uh, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to post them on WhatsApp. So there's not a lot of people uh, tuned in today. We don't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, <coughs> um, what I'm going to do now is look at um, the OSCE question. We had seven responses. One of them is my own model answer. So about six people responded. You are welcome to um, answer more than one time if you're not happy with your initial answer. This is the question that was posted on the 22nd of May. And the first part, I just need you to enter your name. There's a clinical picture. And based on this photo, what is the diagnosis? You should enter your answer there. Management for five marks suggests a longer answer. And the follow-up for three marks. 
Uh, what uh, I'd suggest you do is before uh, submitting your answer, once you've typed everything in, uh, you can use something like a cropping tool on your PC or so, and then just take an image of the of your entire answer, right, and save this so that you will have something to refer to. It's, you know, you answer it, and then when you finally get the answer, you can't remember what you actually put in. And unfortunately, the system doesn't allow you to go back and look at your answer. Only um, I have access to the answers. So please, when you are answering, do uh, take a copy of your answer or a screenshot if you're doing it on a mobile phone and uh, save it so that you can refer back to it. Okay, this uh, was a relatively easy question. Um, basically, this was a picture of a patient, face skin patient. This is the left eyebrow, nose of the bridge, bridge of the nose, sorry. And here between the bridge of the nose and the left eye, somewhere there, there's a uh, suspicious looking skin lesion. And this we know is a typical rodent cell ulcer. Rodent ulcer, um, the proper term for it is a basal cell carcinoma. Okay, with regard to management, so let me just make this a bit bigger. Management for five marks, excision with histologically confirmed negative margins, both deep and wide, that means around and deep to the lesion. And um, here, two millimeter margin is usually adequate because it's a very cosmetic area, and we know that basal cell carcinomas are relatively slow growing. Um, A microscopic margin of 0.5 millimeters is acceptable um, with basal cell carcinomas, but macroscopically we are not able to confirm that, so we would normally try for at least 2 to 3 millimeters. Um, if the lesion is bigger than 6 millimeters, then you would want um, a 6 millimeter diameter control. Uh, if the lesion is incompletely excised, a re-excision is required to get clear margins and um, the, to, maintain, uh, to try to maintain normal function and achieve a good cosmetic result. Basal cell carcinomas, basal cell carcinomas generally do not metastasize and just the local excision is adequate for a, a removal. Um, radiation can be used in patients who are not fit for surgery um, or if the surgical excision would be very disfiguring. Okay, so there's quite a bit of information that you are required to provide for five marks. Um, I am not able to individually mark people's answers. So the idea is that you answer the question, keep a record of your answer and then compare your answer to the model answer that is given during the uh, live streams. The third question was what is the follow-up for three marks? Um, there are in fact no specific recommendations uh, for follow-up, uh, but generally a 6 to 12 monthly review to identify any new lesions and to look out for any possible metastatic disease, although we know that is very unlikely. And 44% uh, of patients will develop a basal cell carcinoma within three years after excision although local recurrence is less than 2%. Uh, also, regional recurrence is very rare. Okay, so that's a um, little bit of information on basal cell carcinoma. Uh, if there are any questions, please post it to the surgery registrar group. Uh, there were two other questions that uh, I had posted around the 23rd and 24th of May. However, very few people have answered. I'm going to just give everyone a little bit more time to answer those. And uh, while you've got some time, I finished a little bit early today, and I just wanted to refer you to the teachable.com website. Um, if I haven't already sent you an email giving you access to the site, um, then please let me know, and uh, you are all uh, welcome to this. This is where all the video clips, lectures, everything are stored and you can actually go through them at your own pace. 
Um, there's fracture bullying section, breast surgery, colorectal surgery. Um, I had started this lecture series uh, more than a year ago, so I've got quite a number of uh, lectures and information and videos stored. Um, there's a section on upper GI surgery, hernia surgery, endocrine surgery, pancreas. I've got a little bit of information of FCS exam technique. Then I've got a recording of all the live streams which were first started in May last year and uh, all the way up uh, to last week or so and I will update these on a regular basis. Um, the live stream recordings are also available on YouTube. Um, I normally post the links to the surgery registrar group. If you have any difficulty accessing any of these things, please contact me uh, via WhatsApp, email or call me and I will guide you through it. Then um, upper GI, we also looked at gastric surgery for benign disease, malignant disease. Um, I have uh, the surgery seminars uh, available. And then um, the OSCE questions, like I just posted now, the older questions, the model answers are posted on this uh, website. So teachable.com. If you're unable to access it, uh, please let me know and I will uh, guide you through it. Okay, we're finishing a little bit early today. Thanks very much everyone for watching. All the best.